welcome to biology, the fabric of life. Biology is the study of life. If you go back 200 years, biology largely amounted to documenting the phenomena one observed in nature. If you had traveled to the Yellowstone ecosystem at the turn of the 19th century, you would have observed bison, elk, deer, bears, wildflowers, trees, and other organisms, and documented what you saw. You may even have seen and recorded bears or wolves feeding on those bison or elk, as well as various interactions within and between the many species observed in their environment. Those kinds of observations are still significant in modern biology, as it is important to monitor changes in nature. Modern biology, however, goes well beyond that. Modern biology is concerned with the processes that are responsible for the phenomena we observe. And it is these processes with which we will be most concerned in this course. To understand these processes, you will need a background in some very basic chemistry. This will help you understand the biochemical processes required for life, as well as the energy flow in ecosystems. Additionally, you will then be able to understand the relationship between DNA and an organism's physical and behavioral attributes, and how that genetic material is passed from generation to generation. You will learn about genetic technology and its many uses. We will examine the evolutionary process responsible for the extraordinary diversity of life before exploring that diversity and how the many organisms of nature interact in ecosystems. Finally, we will consider the ecological challenges imposed on nature by humanity. All of this couched within the umbrella of the scientific process responsible for the discovery of this vast body of knowledge. If all goes well, the knowledge gained in this class will make you a better educated citizen with an understanding of the process and value of science, the composition and biochemistry of your body, the role of important biological technologies in your life such as DNA fingerprinting and PCR, and an appreciati appreciation for how the natural world functions and the human impact on nature. So were you to go to the Yellowstone ecosystem at the end of this course in this, the 21st century, it is my hope that you would not just see bison, wolves, bears, grasses, flowers, trees as individual entities occupying the same space and time, but see the chemical reactions behind the organisms, the flow of energy through the eco ecosystem, the family tree that links them all together in a continu continuum of life and feel a responsibility to protect the natural world of which we are a product and upon which we are ultimately dependent. So, given that biology is a type of science, that's really where I'd like to begin with the course. Let's look at the nature of science and the characteristics of good science and bad science. So, science is ultimately has a dual nature to it. It, it is a way of knowing that utilizes a process to generate a body of knowledge, and that body of knowledge then is the product of science. So I'd first like to focus on this scientific process or so-called so, so scientific method. And it begins with, you know, just like other types of knowing, basically gathering information or getting experience in some kind of an area. And as you, you learn about a certain topic, you then ask questions. And so most of the time when you ask questions, you know, you can find answers to those questions. So again, even in a scientific setting, what you would do is you would, uh, you know, uh, again, go to the scientific literature. You might talk to, to your uh, colleagues and so on and you would find answers to your questions. But occasionally, you will pose a question in the sciences, and I suppose other areas as well, for which there is no known answer. And so at that point then, when you hit that wall, when you now go into unknown territory, this is where you pose an hypothesis in the sciences. And so uh, the hypothesis then is a possible explanation to a question that you have posed. Ideally, it is disprovable, but at the very least testable. So again, in the sciences, we're going to have to test this hypothesis. And generally, hypotheses tend to be very specific or narrow in scope. Now, um, the next step then is, is, again, you've posed this possible answer to your question. And again, you could just believe it outright. That would be one way of knowing. But in the sciences, we have to test our ideas. You would ha now have to put this hypothesis to some kind of a test. And there are various ways that you can do that. But uh, really, the, the best way, kind of the gold standard, would be a controlled study or an experiment. And there are different elements to a controlled study or an experiment. And I'm first going to briefly discuss these. And then we'll look at an, an example. And I would think it will make, uh, make them a lot more understandable. So the first element is uh, we would want this to have an independent variable. And so ideally, there is a single independent variable in a, in a well-designed experiment. And the independent variable would be really that thing that you're testing uh, or, the, or the, the thing that you're going to manipulate in your test to see what the effects are. Uh, the dependent variable or variables will be those things affected by your independent variable. 
And normally you can put an experiment into this kind of a, of a phrase. What is the effect of blank on blank? And um, when you do that, the first blank then would be the independent variable, and the second blank would be the de dependent variable. And again, we'll look at an example of this later. Okay, so uh, again, in addition to having independent and dependent variables, then uh, you also then will need to have at least two groups. One that would be the experimental group, and the experimental group is going to be exposed to your independent variable. And then a control group in which you withhold the experimental variable. Now, the importance of that, again, we'll see in a few minutes, but basically it's then to have uh, a comparison so that you can see what happens when you have your independent variable and what happens if that is not present. Now, sometimes uh, in the control group, you can't always withhold the independent variable. So, for example, if you were looking at the effect of temperature on some kind of, uh, uh, in some kind of system, you really can't withhold temperature. There's always going to be some temperature. It may be very cold or very hot, but temperature, you know, you know there's always some degree of temperature. So in those kind of situations, you more or less arbitrarily uh, pick you know, one to be the experimental group and one to be the control group, or you'll pick the norm to be the control group and the thing that's kind of abnormal to be your experimental group. And then last but not least, uh, you'd have a number of controlled variables, and these would be all factors that would be held constant or consistent between your experimental group and your control group. So let's go ahead and consider an example. Let's say that you've done some research, you're interested in disease and you've, um, in human health, and you have learned that there's a part of the country where there's a, a cluster of birth disorders. And let's say that this is near a, um, uh, a ecological super, super fun dumping site and there's a particular pesticide that's associated with this dump and it's suspected that this pesticide may have something to do with this increase in uh, birth disorders that you're seeing in this area. And so you want to put this to a test. So your hypothesis is then that this, this pesticide is causing developmental disorders. So you want to put this to a test. So um, you decide that you're going to use some kind of an animal, animal model for this, and you decide to use something fairly simple and easy to work with, which would be uh, chick development. So you're going to work with eggs. So what you do then is take a bunch of eggs, let's say you take 100 eggs, and uh, eggs have a little air cell at one end of the egg. And so what you do then in trying to use sterile technique, you'll, you would punch a little hole in that eggshell. And then uh, you're going to inject your pesticide into that airspace at the end of the egg and then let that pesticide diffuse into the, uh, into the egg. Now let's say then, let's add a little complication here. Let's say that the pesticide also uh, does not dissolve very well in water. And so you have to dilute that in some weak alcohol solution. So you're going to be injecting then a combination of pesticide and alcohol. So you inject those into the uh, air cell of the egg, uh, you patch the hole, and, then, and that can be done with wax or even Elmer's glue, but you'd hopefully be using some sterile technique here. And then again, that will eventually diffuse uh, into the egg itself, and you're gonna see what effect this has on development. So then the eggs then would be put into an incubator and, um, and allowed to develop, and you'll monitor that development and look to see how many develop normally and how many either die during development or end up being um, deformed in some way. So in this example then, uh, the independent variable would be, if we phrase it this way, what is the effect of blank on blank? We're interested in what is the effect of pesticide on our dependent variable, which in this case will be development. So pesticide will be the independent variable, development it will be the independent variable. And again, we would have two groups here, experimental group and the control group. And so the group that I described just a minute ago, that would be our experimental group. The experimental group then would be exposed to the pesticide. So you'd take 100 eggs, you're injecting pesticide and alcohol, that would be your experimental group. So the question then becomes really uh, with your control group is how are you going to uh, define your control group? Because ideally, remember, we want a single independent variable. So one option you could have would be to take 100 eggs and just incubate those 100 eggs without doing anything to them. But we have to decide then, would that be the best kind of control group? So again, we want a single variable, but we did a lot of things to those eggs. You know, we poked a hole in the egg. Does poking a hole in an egg affect development? I don't know. Do we want to test that? No, we want to test the effect of pesticide in development. So you would need to poke a hole in the egg. Um, what about alcohol? Does alcohol affect development of the chick? I don't know. That's not what we want to test here. We want to test the effect of pesticide on development. So again, you would need to inject alcohol into the egg. You need to patch the hole. So in other words, you want to treat your control group exactly the same as your experimental group, except for one factor. And that one factor will be our independent variable, which was uh, a certain concentration of pesticide. 
So again, with our control group then, we would want to poke a hole. We would want to inject alcohol without pesticide, in this case, into the egg. And eventually that would diffuse into the rest of the egg. We'd patch the hole. And that would now be our control group. So all of the things that we hold constant between the experimental group and the control group, we call controlled variables. So in addition to treating them the same way, we would want other variables to be consistent as well. So in other words, would it matter if we used uh, different breeds of chickens? I don't know. It might. So we want to use the same breed of chickens. Would it matter if we use different types of, of incubators? I don't know. It might. So we would want to use exactly the same incubator, perhaps even rotate them within the same incubator if possible. So everything you could possibly think of to be consistent between the experimental and control group, you want to be consistent except for one single factor, which would be the independent variable. OK. Now, once you've run your experiment then, uh, the next step in the scientific process then is to objectively, and by that I mean statistically, evaluate the data and then come back and evaluate your hypothesis. So whenever possible, again, we try to design experiments that we can statistically evaluate because, again, that takes out any kind of prejudice that you might have in that evaluation. Now, I'm going to come back to that statistical evaluation in just a second, but, but, but one thing I do want to mention is that Experimentation does not always, or a controlled study is not always the best way to test an idea. Sometimes you just have to make more observations. So uh, an example of this for, uh, that I can give you is um, if you go back to the you know, 1960s when um, Jane Goodall and, and her associates began to observe primate behavior. Uh, at that time it was thought that you know, primates were exclusively herbivores, you know, kind of quote unquote peaceful herbivores, if you will. But when uh, biologists and, and physiologists and, and zoologists began to look at their diet, they realized that the diet that was being observed was fairly low in protein, and it really couldn't account for the biomass of the animals, let alone their, their ability to reproduce. And so it was believed that they had to be getting additional protein in their diet. So one of the hypotheses at the time was that they may have been eating, uh, or kind of competing hypotheses, that they were eating some fruits or vegetables that were high in protein, and others felt that they were eating meat. And so uh, anyway, there's no real controlled study for that hypothesis. So in that kind of a situation, what you do is you just go back out in the field and make more observations. And what was eventually observed was that, indeed, uh, occasionally uh, chimpanzees do hunt. And basically, they, they hunt uh, monkeys. And they'll just hunt them down, run them, run them down, and rip them, <laughs> rip them apart and eat them. So you know, the, the peaceful herbivore actually had uh, a carnivorous side to them, as it turned out. So again, a controlled study doesn't always lend itself um, to the information that you're trying to pursue or a particular hypothesis. So sometimes controlled studies, sometimes you just have to make more observations. Now, uh, getting back then to statistical evaluation. Um, when we look at data sets, say an experimental and control group, or just any data sets, there's always going to be a difference between them. So example, if I were to compare the height of one class to the height of another, they're not going to have exactly the same average height. There would be a, a slight difference there. So, what we have to consider then as scientists is not you know, just that there are differences, but we have to ask ourselves, are the observed differences due to chance, just kind of a sampling artifact, or is there a cause for the difference? So again, if I'm looking at two different classes with a slightly different height, is that just the way it happened? Is that just the way the sampling went that time? Or is there a cause for one class to be taller than another? In other words, if a class had predominantly males compared to females, it would, there would be a cause for that, because males tend to be taller than females. So this is one of the dilemmas we have when we look at data sets. There's always going to be a difference. And so what's, what's the importance of that difference? Is there a cause, or is it just due to chance? So we have to first ask, ask ourselves, you know, can chance duplicate the differences we see in our experimental and control groups? And then if yes, how frequently are we willing to tolerate just a chance duplication? In other words, how much confidence can we have in the results if just randomly we could get the same kind of a result? So what I mean by this is, let's say we, we go back to our example here with the eggs. Let's say in our, in our experimental group that 85 of the 100 eggs develop normally. And let's say in our control group, 92 of the eggs develop normally. So that would give us a difference then of, of seven chickens, if you will, or second, seven chicks that develop normally. So by looking at this single example, you'd say, well, gosh, you know, those that were exposed to the pesticide, you know, more were abnormal. So the pesticide must be causing the difference. Well, and that would, that would possibly be true, but we would want to examine this a little bit further, again, in a, in a, from a scientific perspective. So one of the questions we would have then, well, what if we just randomly assigned these to two different groups? 
uh, could I get the same kind of a difference? And so let's say then that you just randomly took a group of 100 eggs, 50 of which had been exposed to pesticide and 50 of which had only been exposed to the alcohol. How many of them would have developed normally? And then if you took a second group of 100, again, kind of randomly assigned 50 that were exposed to pesticide and 50 that were not, how many of those would develop normally? And what kind of a difference would you get? And how frequently would it be equal to or greater than seven? So in other words, if we just randomly assign them to two, two groups instead of an experimental control group, could we get the same results? And if we did, how frequently would that be an acceptable result to us? And so the standard that we use in the biological sciences is what we call a 95% confidence. So what that means is that if we reran our experiment 100 times, that we would, get, um, uh, we would be certain that there was a cause for the difference 95 times or more per 100. So in other words, we have to be confident that there was a cause for the difference as opposed to just chance duplicating our results more than 95% of the time. And if that's the case, then we say we have a 95% confidence. So again, rather than actually rerunning the experiment hundreds or thousands of times, we have statistical uh, analyses that we can do to do this for us. But again, this 95% confidence is our minimum standard to say, yes, there is a cause for the difference in our data sets. And when we have that kind of confidence, the 95% confidence, the phrase that we use is we say that there's a significant difference in the two groups. So in everyday language, we constantly talk about, oh, it's very significant, and there's a significant this and that. But in the sciences, when we say there's a significant difference, it means we have at least a 95% confidence that there's a cause for the difference in our groups. And um, we can also break down our ideas into what we call null and, and alternate hypotheses. And the null hypothesis is, is a standard hypothesis which says that the difference in our groups is due to chance. The alternate hypothesis is that the difference in our groups is due to uh, a cause. And so again, if we have at least a 95% confidence in our results, then we would uh, reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternate hypothesis that there is a cause for the difference. So null hypothesis versus alternate hypothesis. OK, now, getting back to our process then, once we have objectively evaluated and statistically evaluated our data then, we can either accept our hypothesis, reject our hypothesis, or we may modify the, the hypothesis and retest again. So as we look at the scientific process then, uh, the next step then would be to communicate results. And we can do this formally in peer-reviewed journals uh, or at scientific conferences. Also, of course, scientists just informally communicate with one another all the time. But the important is to communicate because, again, we're looking now in an area where there is no answer. No one's ever perhaps investigated this idea before. And in our example, if I were to present that, I'm sure I'd find out there are a lot of problems with that example. You know, so in other words, would a one-time exposure to a pesticide be the same as chronic exposure? No, it wouldn't. You know, so that's not a great thing. Also, would be using a chicken as a substitute for uh, human tissues be a good uh, substitute? And no, probably not. So there are a lot of problems, actually, with our little example. And I'm sure I would find those out if if I went public with my, with my findings. So it's very good and important to get, not only communicate to say, hey, this is what I've done, but also then get the, the feedback. And then others can try to duplicate your results. So that's another aspect of this, is that others have to be able to get the same results that you do for it to have scientific validity. So when we look at the products of science then, certainly the data that we generate is one of the products. The hypotheses that we propose uh, and, and test uh, would also be a product. And Again, I think the public has this idea that hypotheses are just kind of quote unquote educated guesses, and they, they may start out that way. So hypotheses start out as being unverified. But once they've been tested, and then retested, and retested, and retested, they become verified hypotheses. And verified hypotheses are factual. Um, likewise with theories. Again, I think most people uh, in the public think that a theory just you know, is very nebulous, hasn't really been tested. But that, and that can be true initially. but. Uh, but once you retest and retest and retest theories, they become verified theories as well. And again, we look at them as being factual. So theory then is built from related hypotheses using inductive logic, which I'll get to in a second. It usually addresses the mechanism behind a phenomenon that you observe. It tends to be predictive uh, using deductive reasoning. And verified theory, again, we consider it to be factual. So, uh, so again, um, once ideas have been tested and retested, 
they gain confidence, and eventually we look at them as being factual. So when we look at uh, the products of science then, again, data, hypotheses, theories, and then also principles and laws are sometimes used. We don't use those a lot in the biological sciences, but basically principles and laws are just uh, statements of observations that have been made. And uh, again, usually are considered factual. So an example would be the law of conservation of matter. The law of conservation, conservation of matter simply states that matter is neither created nor destroyed in chemical reactions. So it doesn't really address the mechanism behind that. It's just merely a statement of observed uh, phenomena and, and, again, are generally considered to be factual. So, again, uh, in the general public's minds, I think they think that hypotheses are very uh, unverified and that laws are very verified. But, again, we can look at hypotheses, theories, and principles and laws as all being verified and essentially factual. So. Uh, we use basically two types of logic then in building our ideas. Uh, one is inductive reasoning or logic, and here's where we, we take specific examples and build to broad conclusions, and this is how hypotheses are used to build theories. So, for example, um, with the discovery of the microscope, uh, you know, as people began to look at different types of organisms, they always found that they were composed of, of cells or the products of cells. And so over time, after repeatedly seeing this over and over and over again, this generally eventually led to the general theory the cell theory, which is that organisms are composed of cells and their products, and that cells give rise to other cells. So again, you're building from very specific observations to a broad idea. That's inductive reasoning. And then deductive reasoning or logic, you take a general concept and make specific predictions. So you'll take, uh, and this is how we use theory to predict hypotheses, and generally this can be phrased as an if-then kind of statement. So, if organisms are composed of cells and their products, then, even though I may never have looked at a banana leaf, if I look at a banana leaf, I would predict that it would be composed of cells. So, and I would find that to be true uh, if I did so. So that would be deductive reasoning or logic. So as we look at characteristics or, or, or qualities of, of good science, um, one of the characteristics is that science is mechanistic. In other words, we have to be able to rest the mechanisms behind what we observe. And I think we kind of intuitively do science all the time. And an example I often use is when my oldest daughter, who's a grown woman now, but when she was a child, um, she had been to her grandmother's house. Her grandmother had, uh, is a Jehovah's Witness and had been talking about how God did different things. And so my daughter was eating dinner one night as the sun was setting. And um, she was uh, saying that Grandma says God does this and Grandma says God does that. And then she was looking at the sunset and she said, Hey, Daddy, how does, what makes the sun go down? And I said, well, you know, God does it. And she said, no, Daddy, I mean really. And so what she was asking for was a mechanism to explain what she was seeing. And so you know, I got out a, uh, an orange and put a dot on it and a flashlight and showed her how the Earth spins and how when you approach the light that's sunset and you go away from the light that's sundown. And I didn't think much of it. And then when she was around 12, we were, we were uh, you know, driving along and the sun was setting very rapidly in the, in, the, in the distance. And she said, hey, Daddy, look how fast the Earth is spinning. And so I was very impressed by that, that she had remembered that. But the point is she was looking at a mechanism. She was interested in the mechanism behind what she was seeing. And again, we kind of intuitively do that. Now, we also have to work in the natural world. So we have to generate data and evaluate data. So that is something then that is in the natural world. Um, it's magic is not a scientific answer because we can't evaluate that in any, any way, shape, or form. And so again, this is one of the places where you know, science and religion, I think, uh, collide because we can't go to that. God did it, kind of an answer. We have to examine an answer. Our ideas have to be testable. So in other words, I just can't decide to believe something because I want to believe it. it or, you know, or that it's logical. That's not good enough. We have to put it to a test, generate the data, evaluate, and then come back to our hypothesis. Along the same line then, science is, is evidentiary. So again, it has to generate a product that can be evaluated. So I might have a dream that a certain drug is, it, it will cure cancer. That doesn't make it true. So again, I would have to put it to the test, generate the data, and, and, and see if that is true or not. Um, so again, we have to be based on ev evidence, and we just can't kind of a priori go to a conclusion and accept a conclusion as fact. Uh, we also have to be objective. And so again, kind of the antithesis of objectivity would be faith. So we cannot have faith in our results or faith in ideas. Our ideas are only as good as the next test. So we have to be as objective as possible. So um, 
kind of related to this, I, I will be talking about in a, in a supplement to this unit about anecdotes and, and testimonials, and I'll come back to that, and also placebo effects. So that's something I'll talk about in a supplement to this particular module. And, and as related to that, then, what are called blind studies and double blind studies, and the importance, then, in uh, doing these kinds of studies to uh, account for the placebo effect and ensure objectivity. Now, uh, conti continuing this idea, then, of, of the characteristics of good science, then, is that science, scientific ideas or, or, or tests, then, also have to be repeatable. So again, if I do a certain test on an hypothesis and I get a certain result, you should be able to do the same test and get the same result. And as a graduate student, you know, that's what happens a lot of times. Our, our major professors will just bring us something and say, hey, see if you can do this. See if you can get the same kind of results. And then another aspect of quality science, or, or a truth about science, I guess, is that there are no absolute truths. Because again, as we're going into areas where no one has ever investigated before, there's no one to say, yeah, that's right. So it becomes the collective intellect that really helps us determine the truth and the repeated testing that helps us determine that truth. So as we look at the public's skepticism of science, then I think there are a lot of, of reasons for this. And certainly one of those is a, kind of a lack of understanding of the scientific process. Um, I think that, uh, again, it, that is a very important idea. Just understand the process so you'll know why scientists think what they think. And again, for some people, they, they get frustrated by the fact that scientists sometimes change their minds. But again, that is good science in that if you get new information, you always have to go back and reassess your hypothesis, your idea. Also, I think in the public's mind that being reasoned, uh, that a reasoned conclusion, or if it's logical, that that is, is good science. But that's not always good science. Again, you may have a good idea. Maybe a reasoned idea, maybe logical, but you have to put it to a test. Also, uh, I think in the public's mind that being open to ideas means that you accept ideas. And, and scientists are open to challenges constantly, but we have to put our ideas to a test. So we cannot just a priori accept ideas without that test. And then, of course, certainly in the public, there is a clash of religion and science. And so, again, it's nice to want to integrate the two, but really, uh, faith and science are completely different things. But it doesn't mean that a single individual can't practice both. So I hope you'll be open then to the importance of science in your lives because we need all of the great minds that we can get.